Hebrews 1 to start with. If you turn there, please, Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going to continue in our series on the fundamentals of right division. And uh, thus far, we have talked about, first of all, the need for personal Bible study. Uh, then in our second message, we talked about the importance of having the right motive in our Bible study, that we are to study, Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, Bible study ought to be about our personal relationship with God. We want to know Him. We want to know His will. We want to please Him. And uh, the judgment seat of Christ is in view. Our Christian service is going to be tried what sort it is and the quality of it. And we can't serve God in His will if we don't know what His will is. And we're not going to know His will if we don't study His Word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we're not studying his word, we ought to be ashamed. And we're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ because we're not going to serve him the way we need to if we don't know his word. And really, Bible study is about ministry. You know, personal growth, yes. But you can't help others if you don't know God's truth. And as you learn truth, it's not so that you can look down on others. It's so that you can help others see the truth also. So we talked about the need for personal Bible study. We talked about our motive. And then thirdly, we emphasized the word of truth. And we talked about how believing the Bible and rightly dividing it go hand in hand. Um, then last time we talked about rules for Bible study. And we gave ten. <laughs> Ten rules that we need to follow in our Bible study. And the last one is what our focus is going to be from here on. The, 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 the nine of them will help us use the main key. That was number ten in our list. And that is rightly dividing the word of truth. Following the rules that we gave is going to enable us to, to rightly divide like we need to. So all of that was introduction. From this point on in this series, our focus will be on rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to start very basic, and we'll add more detail as we go. God does not change. The Bible said in Malachi 3, verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Well, He does not change in His person who He is. He's perfect. Doesn't need to change. <laughs> He doesn't change in his principles, and he doesn't change in the promises that he makes. Thank God for that. He doesn't go back on his word. But he certainly does change in how he deals with man. In Hebrews chapter 1, notice in verse 8 concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God. So yes, Jesus Christ is God. Somebody said, well, I don't think so. Well, God the Father said he was, so you ought to agree with him. <laughs> the Father said to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, this is the Lord Jesus, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth. And the heavens are the works of thine hands. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's John chapter 1. So the Creator God. You go back into Genesis 1. God, singular, said, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So he said, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. Uh, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. They shall be changed, but thou art the same. And thy years shall not fail. 
In Hebrews 13, 8, a well-known verse, it says, Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. That's an attribute of God. God is immutable. We all change, and we all need to change. God doesn't change because He's God. Jesus Christ is God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That does not mean that He never changes in how He deals with man, because obviously He does. It doesn't take much reading of the Bible to understand that. People like to say, well, Jesus healed in His earthly ministry. He healed all those people. And so therefore, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever, He'll do all that now. But He's not doing that now like He was then. As signs of the kingdom, there's a difference in His dealings with man. Look in the first verse of Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers, this is written to the Hebrews, so this is the Hebrew fathers, by the prophets, hath in these last days, and this book has to do with the Hebrews in the last days of prophecy, spoken unto us by his son, and so on. But you notice sundry times, that's, you see the word sunder in there, separate, various, divers, that's different. So God doesn't change in his person. But the first verse here says that sundry times and divers manner spake. There are changes in how he's dealing with man as revealed in the scriptures. And if you don't understand that, the Bible will be a confusing book to you. And it's not going to be God's fault because God's not the author of confusion. It's going to be our fault for not studying the Bible his way. He tells us how to understand his word. But if we don't follow that, It'll be confusing to us. You cannot obey everything in the Bible. People take the whole Bible and pretend it's a love letter written directly to them, and it's, everything in it is to them. Now, everything in it's for us, but it's certainly not all to us. You can't possibly follow all the instructions in the Word of God. Let me give you a very simple example of what I'm talking about. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Just take the very basic issue of what to eat. Isn't that very basic? <laughs> well, so you pick up the Bible, you've never read it, and you're starting off in Genesis 1. What should I eat? Well, it says in Genesis 1 verse 29, and God said... Behold, I have given you, talking about the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you shall be for meat. In the Bible, meat just means food. Doesn't always mean literally meat. All food is like meat. The Bible uses the term that way. Vegetarian, okay? He, Adam did not eat meat of animals. Before the fall, obviously, but even afterward, there's no record. So, what should I eat? Well, it tells you right here, every herb <laughs> and the, the, the fruit of the, of, of the tree. I mean, that's what you're to eat. That's depressing <laughs> for somebody like me. <laughs> well, you know what? That was God's instruction to Adam, but things changed, didn't it? Adam fell. By the way, is there a difference between how God dealt with Adam before he fell and after? Yeah, it doesn't take much of a, 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 it's just a superficial reading of the scripture will show you that. So things change. So then I come about 1,500 years later to Genesis 9, and there's been a flood, a universal cataclysmic flood judgment. And when Noah steps off the ark with his sons, Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, in Genesis 9 it says in verse Three, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Amen. Now that's more like it. <laughs> I've been watching a little bit of Beverly Hillbillies lately. And as I like Granny now, I'm going to tell you, she is hilarious. And Jed Clampett, too. I mean, woo doggy. I mean, he is right. There. I love the Clampets, man. And they're always talking about eating, you know, possum and, and uh, 
chicken hawk and sow's belly or I don't know, all kind of manner of things. Well, hey, go ahead. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb, so you keep eating that also, have I given you all things. But, stipulation, flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. That's advanced science right there, too, about life being in the, in the blood. But he said, you can't eat it with blood. All right? So, yeah, eat your steak, but it can't be rare. Which don't bother me, because I don't like it rare anyway. I like it medium. Now, let's skip ahead a thousand years or so to ex or Leviticus. So I start off, and I'm told I can only eat the herb and the fruit and all that. Then I come to Noah, and lo and behold, I can now eat meat, but it can't be with blood. Then I keep reading, and I come to Leviticus chapter 11. And you got a whole chapter telling you specifically what to eat and what not to eat. And I come to Leviticus 11. Let's just read the end of the chapter. Verse 46 this is the law of the beasts, and of the fowl, and of every living creature that moveth in the waters, and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. So there's a, a number of things that are outlawed. I mean, you're forbidden. It's unclean. God's word has pronounced unclean. Do not eat the shrimp. What a heartbreak. Do not eat the pork. God help us. I mean, but that, and God had a reason, and it's not my point right now to explain all that, but that was God's word. Look, you can, you can only eat certain things. But let's go about 1,500 years later, and we finally come to Paul in 1 Timothy 4. And you know what it says, and this is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. <laughs> 1 Timothy 4. So far, we've seen God said, no meat. Then he said, okay, meat, with, but you can't eat it with blood. And then he said, only certain meats. Now, here's another change. Through the Apostle Paul, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what are these doctrines of devils? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. Know any religions that do that? It's a doctrine of devils. Commanding to abstain from meats. As though you're going to be right with God on the basis of not eating certain meats. That's not the way it is under grace. God himself had commanded them to abstain from certain meats under the law, but Paul's writing under grace, not the law. So if the devil can't get you to deny the word of God, he will work on you to make sure you get it out of its place and not rightly divide it. And what was right in time past under the dispensation of law becomes a doctrine of devils when you try to force it in the dispensation of grace. That's vital. See, the devil, if he can't get you to deny the Bible altogether, he'll deceive you with it. He'll quote, he quoted scripture to Jesus Christ out of context, omitting words from it. And if he had the audacity to do that to the Son of God, what's he going to do with people who don't even read their Bible half the time? And so it was God's will at one point to abstain from meats, but that's not how it is now because notice what he said, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Well, here's the truth today under grace. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be reviewed. Granny can eat that possum. No problem. I, I don't see how in the world you could eat a possum, man. Them things look like... I, I still remember the first time I opened the shed when I was just a little kid. opened that door and I saw a possum staring. I thought it was a devil in there. That thing looked so evil. Oh, it gave me the heebie-jeebies. How in the world could you eat a possum? Well, but you can if you want. Just thank God for it. Every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. Why? It's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. God says what's clean and unclean. There was a time where he pronounced certain meats unclean. He changed on that and said now it's clean. Right? That's four different sets of instructions. Which one are you going to follow? Well... You better follow what Paul said because he's the one writing to you in this age. 
Okay? Now, you can't get around the fact that things change in the Bible. It's a progressive revelation. God is revealing more things. Not everything stays the same throughout the Scripture. Another important thing we need to know is we need to distinguish between moral truth and dispensational truth. There are moral principles that never change, but there are things that do change. That's dispensational truth, and we'll, we'll define dispensation in just a moment. But look at Romans 13. See, there are things in the Bible that apply in every age. They never change. For example, murder is wrong in every dispensation. There's not going to be a dispensation where God says, okay, it's all right now to murder someone. That's not, that's not going to happen. That's a moral truth. Don't murder. That never changes. But the Sabbath day is dispensational truth. God never told us to keep the Sabbath holy. He ne it was a sign between God and Israel. He never told us to observe it, and he did not change it to Sunday. It is the seventh day, and it was never changed to the first day. And that's why when you read Paul's epistles, you're going to see where Paul said, Let no man judge you concerning Sabbath days, Colossians 2.16. You're not under that. Romans 13, notice in verse number 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And he's going to give the last five of the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, the first five deal with our relationship toward God. The last five, our relationship toward man. He's saying, if you love your neighbor, then thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended as saying, Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul reaffirms the moral commandments. He talks about not committing idolatry, uh, not taking God's grace in vain. He talks about all, there's only one of the ten that he does not reaffirm, and that's the Sabbath. And he, cl he clearly says we're not under that. So there's moral truth, and then there is dispensational truth. And you've got to know the difference. All through the Bible, there are applications you can make, moral principles. That's why you need the whole Bible. All of the Bible is the Word of God. And there are things all through it that we can apply. But you better recognize there are things in it that change. And it's people's failure to recognize that that messes them up so much in their doctrine and in their Christian walk. Let's go to 2 Timothy now. Chapter 3. Verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So all Scripture being the Word of God, not the Word of man, guess what? It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. And what does that mean? Well, the verse explains it, truly furnished in all good works. We can do the good works God wants us to do, if we will know His Word and receive His Word, all Scripture. And so all Scripture is profitable for us. But we're not going to gain the profit that God put in His Word for us if we don't study it His way. And before we read 2 Timothy 3.16, we read 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So God's saying, look, it's all profitable, but there are divisions in it. It's all the word of truth. Don't get rid of any of it. But you better recognize those divisions that God put in his word. Isn't it fitting that these two great statements are given in the last book of the Bible that was written? The Bible's not laid out chronologically. It's laid out dispensationally. 
2 Timothy, Paul said he fulfilled the word of God, Colossians 1.25. 2 Timothy, I believe, is the last book that's written. And I think one of the proofs of that, it's the book that says all Scripture. It's all been given now. It's given by inspiration of God. And now that it's all been given, you better rightly divide it. So there was a time before God revealed what he did to Paul, there wasn't really a need to divide it like there is now that we have the revelations through Paul because with the revelations through Paul, things changed so drastically. And so uh, let me just briefly review with you the outline we've already given in our, in our introductory lessons, and that's first of all the mandate is to study. This is not a suggestion. Study. It's a mandate. That's what we're to do. The motive is, here's why we're to do it, to show thyself approved unto man. No, the fear of man brings a snare. Show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. What's the method? In the one verse we're told to study, we're told how to do it, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the, the method of Bible study. All the Bible is the word of truth. So we're not talking about, when we talk about rightly dividing, we're not talking about rightly dividing truth from error. Obviously, as you study the Bible, you'll be able to do that also. But he said rightly dividing the word of truth. In the Bible itself, there are divisions. And we got to recognize those divisions. And we got to consistently maintain those divisions if we're going to understand the word of God. What was truth for Israel under the law may not be truth for the body of Christ under grace. It was truth for Israel not to eat pork. That's not truth for today. Anybody that stands up today and says, you're not right with God if you eat pork, they're teaching a doctrine of devils today. Now, that's the dispensational approach to Bible study. That's the right approach. Now, people say, well, all you do is hang everything on one verse, rightly dividing. Well, look. Dispensational truth is clear throughout the scriptures. You don't even need that one verse to understand that you got to rightly divide. But that's where it's plainly said. And people try to, the new versions don't translate this. They, they misinterpret it. They say properly handling. Properly handling is not a translation from the Greek. You don't, you, when you faithfully translate from the Greek in 2 Timothy 2.15, you know what it says? Rightly dividing. <laughs> okay. That Greek term cannot be properly translated, properly handled. That, that's an interpretation. That's not a translation, and it's a wrong interpretation. But you know what? I don't care about the Greek. I don't know Greek. I can look at the context of this verse in English and understand what rightly dividing means. If you want to understand a term in the Bible, look at the context. What does he say? Look at verse 16. But shun. So on the positive side, study. And then on the negative side, shun. Okay, anything that doesn't line up with the word of God rightly divided needs to be shunned. But shun profane and vain babblings. That's all false doctrine. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. When you believe sound doctrine, it produces godliness. When you believe false doctrine, it produces ungodliness. What you believe determines how you behave. That's why doctrine's so practical. And their word will eat as doth the canker. Of false doctrine is a disease. It's like cancer. Of whom is Hymenius and Philetus? Now look at it in verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. They did not deny the resurrection. They said it was past already. They put it in the wrong place. They did not rightly divide. Rightly dividing the Bible is getting everything in its proper place where God put it. So you take truth of a resurrection and you put it in the wrong place. Now you're not rightly dividing and you're resting, Peter said, you're resting the scriptures to your own destruction. You know what? Remember this. We must be careful not to invent our own divisions. Or ignore the ones God put in his word. Now, most people today are doing one or the other. They're either inventing their own divisions that aren't in the Bible, like the Acts 28 position that says the body of Christ didn't start until the end of the book of Acts. That, that 
is not a right division of the Word of God. That's a wrong division. They put a division where there, is, where there shouldn't be one. And then there are people who ignore. There is a clear division when Paul comes on the scene with a new ministry given to him of the Lord, something big changes. What do people do? They ignore that, and they go back to Acts 2 and say, that's where it's at. Well, that Jewish feast day was in accordance with prophecy concerning Israel, and yet when Paul comes on the scene, he gets new information hidden from the prophets. And so if you look at you know, the majority view, even among dispensationalists, they're going to say Acts 2 is when this age began. I believe that's ignoring a clear division that God put in His Word. But then you have a minority that say, well, let's go way too far with it and put it in Acts 28. The right view is what we would call a mid-Acts view. But you've got to be careful with the book of Acts because the purpose of the book is not to reveal this age anyway. It's a historical book about a transition and the fall of Israel, you got to go to Paul's epistles to understand where this dispensation began. It began with his ministry. Now, there's always been an attack on dispensationalism. And and it's no wonder, because that's the way God told us to study the Bible. Wouldn't we expect it to be attacked? Many simply do not understand the matter. And that's proven by how they misrepresent it when they try to attack it. Proverbs says in Proverbs 18... Verse 13, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And you listen to the common attacks on dispensationalism, and the people that are attacking it so often have no idea what they're talking about. They obviously don't understand what it even is all about, but they attack it because it goes contrary to their tradition. So they assume it's wrong. That's not what I've always heard. Well, maybe what you've always heard is wrong. We believe the whole Bible. Every word of God is pure. I don't want to do away with any of it. I believe all of it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the God. I'm not trying to chop up the Bible. I'm not trying to get rid of any of it. That's what they accuse us of. Oh, you're chopping up the Bible. You just don't want to follow all the teachings of Christ. Well, you don't, so maybe you don't either. Because nobody out there, no matter what they claim, is following Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to a T. Now, there are principles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course. But there are things dispensationally that even the people that use the red-letter Bible and claim they're following all the teachings of Christ, they're clearly not. Now, look, we're not trying to get rid of any of it. That's not the point. We're trying to understand it. And, And we want to put things in their proper place. And it is insanity for you to think that everything in this Bible God said to you. Why don't you go build an ark then? Why don't you go slay a lamb then? You know, people, they say stuff, but they don't put their money where their mouth is. They talk about how they, the whole Bible's to them and every promise in the book is mine. They say all that. They don't live that way. And then they get mad at us for pointing out the obvious. Look, we're not magnifying a man. They say, oh, you worship Paul. You know, no, we don't. We worship Christ. And you know what? We're not magnifying a man, but we're magnifying his office because that's what God did. Paul said, I magnify mine office. We are magnifying the fact that God chose him as a spokesman and apostle to the Gentiles. And we got to acknowledge that. Christ said, "If, if you don't receive whom I send, you don't receive me. Did Christ not send Paul? There's a clear emphasis on how he was sent to us as our apostle in this age of grace. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? So we're we're following Christ through a pattern, through a spokesman. We're not just following Paul. And Paul rebuked the Corinthians for just following him as a man. We're not to do that. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to the Word of God, do not add to it and do not diminish it. Isn't there clear warnings about that? Don't add to it. Don't diminish from it. 
But God said divide it. And if you know math, which I don't, <laughs> but I know enough that if you add to a number or subtract a number, you change it. But when you divide it, you just get more out of it. You're getting out of it what was in there. <laughs> you get more out of the Bible when you divide it. Somebody say, well, you can't, you hyper dispensationalist, you know. Next time somebody calls you, they ask them to spell it <laughs> and ask them what it means. Call them a hyper ignoramus. They say, oh, you can't get a blessing out of the Old Testament. Let me tell you something. I enjoy the Old Testament far more now than I ever did before I learned how to rightly divide. I read it every evening. I read, the, I, I read through the Old Testament. I read the Old Testament. I read... By the way, if you read, through, if you read three chapters of Paul's epistles a day, you'll read through all 13 epistles every month. That's a good practice. And then you can read the rest. Of, and and I, read, I read mainly from Paul in the morning. That's my mail. <laughs> but I read the whole Bible. I don't, I don't know how... And, and these people that say you can't get a blessing, and I'm not trying to be... Uh, I don't want you to misunderstand what my point in this is. I'm not trying to brag, but I guarantee you I've probably read the Bible more than they have. And yet they're going to tell me I don't get a blessing out of the Old Testament. I don't even know how many times I've read through the Old Testament. And they're going to sit there and accuse me of not getting a blessing. I enjoy the Old Testament. I read it all the time. So look in Ephesians 3. So let's talk for a minute about and I'm going to put a couple things up here on the board. And uh, wrap this up here in about an hour. Um, you know what? Dispensation is a Bible word. I've heard preachers say, I hate dispensationalism. I mean, what a fool to say you hate something in the Word of God. Dispensation was not invented by Schofield. It was not invented by Darby. It was not invented by anybody you want to name. It's in the Word of God. Paul used the word four times. He said in 1 Corinthians 9, 17, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He said in Ephesians 1, 10, he referred to the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's yet future. Then he talked about the dispensation of the grace of God. So I have in Ephesians 3, the dispensation of the grace of God. I have in Ephesians 1, a future dispensation of the fullness of times. That tells you right there there are different dispensations in the Bible. And then in Colossians 1.25, he referred to the dispensation of God, which was the mystery given to Paul. Basically, the word means a dealing out, a distribution, a dispensing of something. Very simple. It's an administration. It's not a period of time. Dispensations are not cut and dried periods of time. Ages are periods of time. Paul referred to past ages. He referred to ages to come. There are different ages. Dispensations operate within an age. Now, notice here on the board five things, and I've given you this many times, and if you've never written this down, you need to write it down, because if you will understand those five things, you will identify the dispensations in the Bible. Every dispensation is marked by, number one, a divine revelation. That means new revelation that brings about a big change in how God's dealing with man. A divine revelation, with that comes a human spokesman to make it known. Okay, God reveals it to a man. The, the man writes it in the Word of God. By the Spirit of God, there's a spokesman. Okay, for an example, God took Moses up on a mountain, gave him the revelation of the law. Moses was the spokesman of the law. Well, Paul, uh, God took Paul up on a mount in the wilderness and revealed, dis, uh, revealed revelations concerning this age of grace. He's the spokesman for that. Okay? Then you have human responsibility. Well, once God makes something known, He expects man to believe it and to follow it. There is responsibility to the revelation. Then there's human failure. Inevitably, man fails. God doesn't fail. Man fails. Every dispensation is marked by human apostasy. Except the last one, the fullness of times, it's the eternal state. Well... There's no remedy for apostasy. You know what has to happen? It's called judgment. Every dispensation ends with a judgment of God. 
So you can go through the Bible and you can mark. My personal opinion is, you don't have to agree, I could care less to be honest with you, how many dispensations you think are in the Bible versus how many. I, the point is not how many, the point is they're there. And I know good men that disagree on this. I believe there are seven that are revealed in time. Seven is a number of perfection and completion. And then there is a new beginning, eternal state, new heaven, new earth. That's the dispensation, the fullness of times. So I don't have a problem with the basic outline in the Schofield Bible. I, I do have a problem with where he starts and stops some of these. But you have innocence before the fall, conscience after the fall, leading up to human government through Noah, promise through Abraham, the law through Moses, the mystery through Paul, then the kingdom after this age. So you could follow that, and I think that's accurate. But I'm not going to break fellowship with somebody who wants to say there's less or more. Okay, We're not going to start a whole denomination called the Church of the Seven Dispensations. You know, it amazes me what people fight about. You know, look, the main thing is you understand there are different ones in there. We can disagree on some of the details. Ephesians 3. Look at this, crystal clear. Verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. So I'm going to read this one passage to show you what a dispensation is because. It's clear as you read this. I can read all the others, but for time we're going to look at this one. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. So a dispensation is a dispensing of something. So grace has been dispensed through Paul to us, word. In other words, it was made known to him to give to us. How that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote a four and few words. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Paul got it directly from the Lord. He wrote it in the Word of God. And we're going to know it when we read what Paul wrote, if we believe it. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And people will use this verse and say, see, Paul didn't get it by himself. Paul didn't get it by himself. Will we know that? We never said he did. We said he got it first. And once it was made known to him and he preached it, others saw it too, right? They saw it by the Spirit. Paul got it first from Christ. Here it is, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. How do you get in the body? The mystery in the Bible is a secret that you can't know till God reveals it. Well, it's been revealed. What is this mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. How do you get in the body of Christ? By the gospel. Paul said he received that gospel by revelation in Galatians 1. It's the gospel, the grace of God, that puts us in the body of Christ. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. So Paul wasn't, you know, full of pride. He knew he didn't deserve this, but he gave God the glory. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. It was hidden God till he made it known to Paul. Is that not crystal clear? But religion will blind you to this. Who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. The manifold wisdom of God according, look at this, to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, it wasn't plan B. Some people say, well, Israel fell, and God said, what do I do now? I better do something else. He knew they were going to fall, and then he revealed a secret that he planned before the world began, but he had kept it, he kept it hid. It's not plan B. It's an eternal purpose. God had it planned the whole time, but he didn't reveal it until he revealed it to Paul. That's not, by the way, that's not my interpretation. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> But you're, it's amazing the people in the professing church today that think what I just so, told you is, he, is heresy. I just read it right out of the Bible. But they can't see it 
because of spiritual blindness. Let me show you something. Very simple. If we're going to divide the Bible, we're going to, I'm giving this in a nutshell, and then we're going to develop this as we go. But I think if you're going to divide something, you've got to have at least two parts, right? <laughs> you can't, if you divide it, there's two. So let me give you, what is the twofold division? Be careful before you answer. Don't shout it out. What is the twofold division in the Bible? It's not Old Testament, New Testament. Okay? And, I, and I'll talk more about that later as we go. Most people think, you know, Genesis to Malachi, that's Israel. Matthew to Revelation, that's the church. Error, you know, Israel was God's old covenant. The church is God's new covenant. We're not even under the new covenant. And if you read the details of what it means to be under the new covenant, you know you're not under that. Now, we're saved by the blood of the New Testament, but there's a difference in the Bible between a covenant and a testament. Um, did you know that Israel in the kingdom is going to be a New Testament church? <laughs> and it's not the body of Christ? So, the Old Testament, New Testament is not the main division. The main division is between that which was spoken by all the prophets since the world began. You find that phrase in Luke 1 and Acts 3 concerning Israel, concerning Israel. God had a, and look, we're going to develop this more later in another lesson, but there's a twofold purpose that God has revealed in the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, he began to reveal immediately his plan for the earth, and that has to do with Israel and a kingdom on the earth, Israel over the Gentiles. So when you look at your Bible, and you notice I got Genesis through Revelation, here's a real simple division. You can put prophecy. And, and, and it goes on over here. And then you have the mystery. Every, you can divide the Bible that simply that there are things spoken by the prophets concerning Israel and the kingdom and the earth, but then there was a mystery hid from the prophets the prophets knew nothing about. Paul said this mystery was kept secret since the world began. It was revealed to him. Acts 3.21, spoken since the world began. Romans 16.25, Paul said, secret since the world began. That's a twofold division. That's very simple. This whole Bible, all 66 books, you have only 13 of them that concern what was kept a mystery, the body of Christ. Now, there are mysteries of the kingdom. We understand that. But I'm talking about the mystery of the body of Christ. That's in Romans through Philemon. The rest of it has to do with prophecy about this earth. Just check it and see. Very simple. Look at Ephesians 2, and I'm not going to read too much of this because we read the whole chapter for our scripture reading, but let's give a threefold division. We had a twofold division. What about a threefold? I think the Bible will give you a threefold division. Verse 11 Wherefore remember that ye being what? In time past. All right? There was a time past in which, and I'm not going to read all the verses. There was a distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. And circumcision came in with Abraham. And I'm just giving you a very simple overview, so I'm not getting into a lot of detail right now. But there was a time past when God made that distinction between Jew and Gentile. And there was a reason for that. Uh, he gave up the Gentile world because of their idolatry, and they knew God, but they glorified him not as God. You read it in Romans 1. He took out a man, Abram made him Abraham, made covenant with him, and uh, with him began the Hebrew people from which he's going to have a nation to rule over the other nations, and the other nations coming to God through Israel. That's got to do with his plan for the earth. Israel is his vehicle to put the kingdom on the earth, okay? So you have time passed, but what does he say in verse 13? But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were far off or made nigh, by the blood of Christ, look in verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. He didn't say at the cross. It was accomplished by the cross. It was revealed later. But now, all right, it's very simple. Here we are, we're living in this time of but now. Well, that, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile now. We're all made one, a spiritual body, seated in heavenly places, not an earthly kingdom, not Israel over the Gentiles. 
Very different. There was time past. There's but now. But look in verse 7. He said that in the ages to come. So after but now, there's ages to come. Right? So you have a threefold division. When you're in your Bible, you better know if you're reading about time past, but now, or ages to come. There, look, th th this present age is going to end with the mystery, as you can see on the board here, of the rapture. He's going to be caught up to meet the Lord. He's going to fulfill what he started back here, and there's ages to come. And we're going to be reigning in heavenly places. Israel's going to be reigning on the earth. There are future ages from where we're living right now. Now, you notice on the, the basic timeline, you have the whole, the real issue throughout the Bible is the kingdom. And God is eternal, and he has an eternal kingdom, but he's going to put a kingdom on the earth, okay? And that's really the main issue through the scripture, the king and his kingdom. It was promised and prophesied in Genesis through Malachi. I mean, that's the emphasis, the coming Messiah and his kingdom, all right? He came in his first advent, and his kingdom was proclaimed. It was at hand. And he preached to Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. This was a kingdom promised to Israel. Okay? And he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, proclaiming that. But he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He was rejected and crucified. But on the cross he prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And so when you come, he rises from the dead, ascends back to heaven, and you come to the book of Acts, and we have a reoffer of that kingdom to Israel. Peter filled the Holy Ghost. He said, if you repent, he'll come back. You see, it's not over for Israel at the cross. They had rejected the Father in the Old Testament. They rejected the Son, but it's in the book of Acts with the witness of the Holy Ghost that was poured out, Christ from heaven pouring out the Holy Ghost on his apostles as that kingdom was reoffered to Israel. When they persist in the rebellion and stone Stephen, a man filled the Holy Ghost in Acts 7, they fall. Okay? Then you have this transition, we'll say from Acts 8 to 28. They fall in Acts 7. But God took a man that was leading the rebellion against him, Saul of Tarsus, saved him by exceeding abundant grace, revealed the gospel, the grace of God to him, took him out in the wilderness, gave him abundance of revelations, continued to show him some things. And what you have in Acts is a transition away from Israel to the body of Christ, from law to grace, from Peter to Paul. There's a transition happening. And one thing about a transition, it's a bridge. And one thing about a bridge, you shouldn't park on it. You've got to keep moving. It's taking you to Paul's epistles. The kingdom's been postponed. It's not at hand. He's building the body of Christ. That's not plan B. It was plan back here before the world began. It was revealed to Paul. That's but now. That's the, the age in which we're living. The mystery of the gospel and the body of Christ. There are other mysteries that correspond to that revealed to Paul. Including how this age ends. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He said, I show you a mystery. The rapture will conclude this age you see there were in prophecy 490 weeks uh, determined 70 weeks I'm sorry 70 weeks determined on Israel that's 490 years uh, 70 weeks of years that's been postponed here there's seven years left that's going to be fulfilled here when the rapture happens tribulation comes at some point after that and there is a seven-year period to be fulfilled concerning Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble. So after you leave Paul's epistles, you go back to the prophetic program that's Hebrews through Revelation. That's why the first book in that section is called Hebrews. It's like a big neon sign saying, look, this isn't the body of Christ because the body of Christ is neither Jew nor Gentile. It's Hebrews. And then after you go through Hebrews, it says James to the 12 tribes. But people just overlook all of that. Hebrews through Revelation fits hand in glove with all of this. Now there are principles, like I said, like a straight line through. But that kingdom is proclaimed once again. And then you see the second coming of Christ to the earth, and the kingdom is finally established. All right? That's a simple overview. So what you have in time past is Genesis through the early Acts, but now Romans through Philemon. Ages to come, Hebrews to Revelation. Prophecy, mystery. 
Very simple. Now, again, I think you could even put seven in on the timeline, and then the eighth being the new beginning, the fullness of times, but I'm not even going to put all that up there right now. Now, that's just an overview. So you see, the Bible's one book, but it's made up of 66 books, and there are divisions, there are differences. And if you know where you're at on the timeline, it'll make all the difference in the world in your understanding. Now, I realized this morning, and I'm about to wrap this up, but I realized this was so basic for most of you. But you know what? There's a couple things about that. First of all, review never hurt anybody. Okay? There are things that need to be emphasized that we might be even further grounded in. But there are always going to be new people coming along who may not have seen some of that that we showed this morning. And plus, this will be put on the Internet. You never know who's going to learn how to rightly divide from this message. So always keep all that in mind. You say, well, what does all that matter? Why does it matter that we understand this? I'll tell you why. Because if you don't rightly divide, you won't get the gospel right. The most important issue about rightly dividing is preaching the gospel, the grace of God, and clarity. The gospel, Paul said, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of our salvation is not Acts 2.38. Okay, it's not. That was the word of truth to Israel. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You trust that message today, you're lost. God didn't give you that message. The word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, was revealed to Paul concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That's it. No baptism is in it. Okay? You don't have to be baptized. And you say, do you think they had to? I, I believe the word of God. They had to be to prove their faith. The water didn't save them. Water can't save anybody. But they were told to do it. Right? We're told, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You can't get more different than Acts 2 and Acts 16. When Israel as a nation asked Peter, what must we do for killing our Messiah? He said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The plain meaning of the words is, if you don't repent and get baptized, you won't get the Holy Ghost. Paul's, there was a Gentile individual that asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe. On the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You know why people that even mean well, and they're probably saved, but sometimes they'll preach the gospel and you go, ouch, you just messed that up. You know why they do that? Because they take verses out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Hebrews to Revelation, that's different from the gospel, the grace of God. And they mix it up, and they don't make the gospel clear. They might know the gospel through Paul, but then because... They don't, they don't realize what they're doing when they say certain things like, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. They don't realize that's not the grace message, okay? And, and so they, they, they muddy the water. And then it's so important because you can't, know what, you can't know God's will for this age if you don't rightly divide. So many people are out of the will of God today. And they're sincere, but they don't know what God's even doing today. They think they're looking for a kingdom on the earth. They think they're God's covenant people. They don't understand what he's doing in the body of Christ in the age of grace. Therefore, they're not spiritually edified. And because they're not spiritually edified, they can't really minister to others. And this rightly dividing clears up all the confusion in religion. It is the answer to all the isms and schisms and it clears up confusion because it's the God-ordained method of Bible study. We can't overemphasize the importance of rightly dividing. So it matters. It's not just like a little hobby horse that we just, you know, well, we just want to be a little different, so we're going to do a little neat thing with, with rightly dividing. No, it is major. It is vital. There's so much more we're going to talk about in detail, but that's just an overview. Let's pray together. Father.